First deputants this afternoon are with Hydro One Inc. I would ask that Ferio Pugliese and Daniel Levitan come forward, please. Make yourselves comfortable, gentlemen. You're going to have five minutes to speak to our committee, and then they will ask you some questions. So please start by stating your names. Ferio Pugliese. Daniel Levitan. And begin any time. Okay, I'd like to thank the chair and the committee members for inviting Hydro One to speak on this important bill and what it means uh, for our customers here in Ontario. I've personally been with Hydro One for close to a year, and since I've started, I've been out in our communities listening to our customers about the fears and frustrations they have about the rising cost of electricity. I've also had the opportunity to listen to over 2.5 million calls we get annually in our call center. We've heard from customers who are struggling to afford their monthly electricity bills, many of which were falling behind on their payments. The message we heard loud and clear was an urgent call for fairness and for relief. And Hydro One answered the call by recognizing there are means within our direct control to address this. So we immediately began with some of our winter relief programs, an initiative to get the lights, and in some cases the heat, back on for hundreds of customers during the coldest months of the year. We've been working with these customers to get them back on track for the long term. And we went above and beyond existing regulations to give our customers more time to work with us. We also canceled the policy of requesting security deposits, an industry first, from our residential customers and reducing, one, uh, reducing to one year the time that we hold business deposits. Following that decision, we returned deposits of $10 million to businesses that were sitting in working capital and another $2 million out of working capital that was returned to residential customers. We also looked at the costs within the control and we've been able to save tens of millions of dollars through increasing productivity finding efficiencies across our business, and better negotiating with our suppliers to reduce costs, uh, operating costs. We recognize that this wasn't enough. While continuing to focus on improving our business and our service levels and providing relief for our customers in the greatest need, important first steps of rising costs of electricity and the burden it places on our customers still needed to be addressed. In February, we gathered leaders from across the company to spend a day in a call center, taking hundreds of calls from customers and what we heard comes as no surprise uh, to members of this committee. We spoke with rural and northern, fam northern families on electric heat whose winter bills were over 500 a month. We talked to single parents and retirees making decisions between food and heat and on fixed incomes. And there was a real sense that something needed to be done and it needed to be done rather urgently. urgently. What our customers needed was relief and fairness. We began meeting with the minister and government officials to deliver feedback directly from these sessions coupled with evidence-based ideas for change built on data that we have received directly from our customers and our customer information systems. From Hydra One's perspective, three things need to happen immediately. Relief on overall cost of power, fair delivery charges for rural, small urban and First Nations communities, and additional assistance for those who need it most. Changes to the global adjustment in the Fair Hydro Plan will bring significant relief to our residential and small business customers. That customer on electric heat I mentioned earlier could see savings close to $75 just on that line item alone. As you know, most residential and business customers live and work in rural northern communities, of which represent 60% of our customer base, where the cost of delivering power to the home is on average higher than that for in a city. For instance, while we have 1.3 million customers, we also have 1.4 million poles. We have more poles than people. That's roughly one pole per person that we serve. And urban distributors conversely typically serve several customers per pole and per infrastructure investment. So fairness is needed for these customers. Bringing their delivery charges in line with the provincial average is the right thing to do. The same customer in Electric Heat could see a further $80 removed from their monthly bill. Last, I will mention the affordability fund that is being developed will provide distributors with greater flexibility in delivering effective home upgrades to their customers who would otherwise be not able to afford them. 
Message from our customers has been loud and clear that they need to see their bills come down. A lot of our customers have done their part. They're adjusting their usage. They've installed efficient lighting and they're winterizing their homes. I will close with this. We want to thank the government and, the Minister, T and Minister Thiebaud for consulting with us on this important matter. We want to thank the members of the committee for giving us the opportunity today to advocate on behalf of our customers. Thank you very much, Mr. Pugliese. Our first questions for you are from our NDP caucus, Mr. Tabins. Mr. Pugliese, thank you very much. Gentlemen, thank you for being here this afternoon. Um, you were pretty straightforward in your commentary. People are struggling. There's an urgent call for relief. You know that at the end of four years, the relief ends and the bills will go up almost 7% a year for the following six years. And when it comes to rest, the bills will be 12% higher than they otherwise would have been. Uh, how do you think your customers will feel about that? Well, I'm certainly not going to speculate on future rate cases and, and what's going on. I can, what I can say to you is, uh, as a company, we're continuing to focus on cost reductions in our operation to continue to make things more efficient and to get costs down. Our focus here is on fairness for our customers and continuing to drive for affordability and electricity. Yeah. Interestingly, I'm not talking about a rate case. I'm talking about the financing for this four years of lower prices. <coughs> financing the period of calm comes to an end in four years and then prices will go up sharply. Given your customers are upset now, how do you think they will respond when the prices start going up sharply again? Well, look, I'm not going to speculate on um, how uh, the financing is going to work over that period of time. I think that's something that should be taken up with the various ministries that have been working on this fiscally. Uh, I think this plan, the adjustments that had been made are needed at this point in time, given what I've seen firsthand in every single community that I've gone into and every customer that I've spoken to with respect to the need to afford electricity today, uh, that adjustments had to take place. And, and that's been our prime focus. So you're not worried that prices will be going up I'm sharply? Not. Our financial accountability officer today, using cabinet documents, ministry documents, showed how it will play out. And that's the scenario. If you have upset customers now, in four years, they're going to be a lot more upset because they're going to be seeing prices shooting through the roof. Uh, but I'll go beyond that. The other thing that the FAO pointed out was that because of the way this whole deal is structured, something that's contrary to public sector accounting rules, by the way, um, we're going to be paying $4 billion more in interest costs to reduce bills than we otherwise would have paid, which will mean higher bills. Does Hydro One support borrowing an extra $4 billion or paying an extra $4 billion, which will drive up hydro rates further for these four years of relief? Well, I, 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 we're not sure that that's uh, 100 percent, I guess, correct in terms of it driving hydro bills up um, over that period of time. Um, I, I think that the changes that have been made here are systemic changes that have had to be put in place to introduce relief that could actually be seen and um, um, benefiting our customers over this longer period of time. And um, I think that between now and the time frame that this plan is in place, there's a lot of work that can be done between all the LDCs in Thank the province, including Thank you very much, Mr. Ourselves. Pugliese. Our next set of questions for you are from MPP Delaney. Well, thank you very much, uh, Chair. Um, perhaps you could expand a little bit more on the uh, rural uh, or remote rate protection program and um, explain from your perspective uh, what it means to you and uh, how uh, it's uh, helpful to your customers. Yeah, that one in particular <coughs> is most, uh, was, was most concerning to us and, and one that we saw probably the most beneficial. If there is a, uh, an LDC in the province that has customers that would benefit the most, from a delivery um, charge benefit, it's going to be ours. The simple reason is that 720 plus thousand of our customers sit in medium to low density areas, which means that they're sitting in places with low population but a high degree of infrastructure. And they're uh, usually subject to uh, high rates and delivery charges for a few reasons. One is just simply because of their location and there's less opportunity to spread the cost out against the number of people there, but secondly, typically living in old stock <coughs> homes, uh, dependent on electric heat and um, poor insulation in, in the, the dwellings that they're living in without access to natural gas. So there's a multitude of factors that actually add to that. So they're getting hit with consumption rates along with high delivery charges. So one of the things that we were strong <coughs> advocates for was trying to bring rural rates 
delivery charges in line with urban rates uh, to bring some level of fairness to uh, that, that charge for those people living up in rural areas. So that's 60 plus percent of our customer base that would be impacted mm -hmm. by that. So roughly three out of five of uh, your customers can expect from an affordability perspective that the impact of this particular bill will be beneficial? Correct. Okay. Um, talking about communicating with your customers about some of the things and as they change that uh, affect their bill and possibly lower their cost, you know, for example, things such as the Ontario Electricity Support Program, uh, the 8% uh, rebate, the proposals uh, made in this bill. Um, how do you uh, communicate with your customers about such things as that that would uh, materially affect their lives? Yeah, there's a variety of ways we do that. We do it through social agencies in particular. That's one of the <coughs> main sources, but we also go direct to customers um, with our direct mail um, uh, communications. Um, we're also shifting to digital channels for those customers that are on digital channels with e-billing um, and use through our portals where we're getting information to them directly on these programs, how they work and how they actually qualify. I will say that social uh, agencies have actually been very instrumental in helping us operationalize those programs. And now with the introduction of the affordability fund, the affordability fund actually allows us another, uh, another avenue to provide support above. Thank you, Mr. Pugliese. Our next set of questions for you are from MPP Smith. Thank you, Chair. Uh, following up on the affordability fund, was that an idea of the government or was that an idea of Hydro One? Uh, predominantly an idea of Hydro One. So is Hydro One or the Ministry in charge of what's going to be paid out in the affordability fund? Uh, it's there, it is set up via a trust. And the trust consists of three local distribution companies, um, ourselves, uh, Hydro, uh, Thunder Bay Hydro, and Electra, along with two social agencies. Uh, the funds are put up in a trust. There's government representation on that board of trustees. Uh, and it is also audited by a third party. So Hydro One does not have direct control over where those funds are allocated. It is established and is adjudicated by the actual Board of Trustees. Uh, what we plan to do with that is invite LDCs from across the province along with um, social agencies, and there's two social agencies that uh, are on that trust uh, fund as well. It's uh, Carleton United <coughs> Way, and it's also ACTO, um, which is the uh, local um, a local um, social agency. The LDCs will bring in cases of affordability forward and the trust uh, will decide and adjudicate how funds should be allocated. At, at what point did Hydro One become a private company? In uh, November 2015. So how was it then that the Ministry directed Hydro One to appear at that event on March 2nd? Uh, how, how did the Ministry um, advise Hydro One to participate in the event on March 2nd where the Fair Hydro Plan was, was unveiled to the public? Uh, that was simply because we had presented some uh, fact-based solutions and recommendations of how we felt the bulk of the customers in Ontario could be impacted, which we represent, uh, was really rationale for that. But, but in the questions that Mr. Tabbins was asking, it didn't seem like you were concerned about the fact that we now have documents showing exactly uh, what the cost of electricity is going to be. And that's a huge concern. I represent a lot of Hydro One customers. It strikes me that it doesn't seem to be concerning to you as Hydro One executives. You know, I think any cost uh, that gets allocated to the electrical system in Ontario is a concern to, ours, to us. I will say this, is that Relief uh, in the form of bringing hydro rates down was, in our opinion, at crisis proportions in the province and needed to be addressed. And I believe that this plan does address that and allows and offers time. But, for but it's going to be at crisis proportions time. again. It's going to be at crisis proportions again. Do you not think that the $25 billion to $93 billion that the FAO said this could cost could be better used? to invest in creating a better transmission system in Ontario or ensuring that we have the equipment that we need to help keep costs down? I'm very sorry to do this. That's our time. <laughs> Thank you very much for appearing here today.